Welcome to Julia for Talented Amateurs, where I make wholesome Julia tutorials for talented amateurs everywhere. I am your host, the Dabbling Doggo. I dabble. Last week, we began to look under the hood of Julia to get a better understanding of how it works. Today, we'll continue to explore Julia under the hood by learning about metaprogramming and macros. First, we'll learn the art of metaprogramming, which is turning code into data and turning data into code. Next, we'll learn about macros which is a form of metaprogramming. We'll learn how they work, and we'll learn how to create our own custom macros. The concepts included in today's tutorial are based on the following YouTube videos. 1. Metaprogramming and Macros in Julia by Stefan Karpinski in 2013. And 2. A Practical Introduction to Metaprogramming in Julia by Andy Ferris in 2018. I will be providing a high-level summary of the concepts used in their presentations. For more detailed information on these concepts, please watch their videos. The links are provided in the description below. As an aside, even if you are not interested in these subjects, I would still recommend watching Stefan Karpinski's video on metaprogramming and macros, simply for historic purposes. Stefan Karpinski is one of the founders of the Julia programming language, and he's giving this presentation in 2013 to a small group using Julia version 0.0.0. .0 .0. Back then, no one really knew if their new programming language would ever take off. Seven years later, they're on version 1.5, and Julia is currently being used around the world. The prefix meta comes from Greek, meaning after. In Greek, the prefix meta is taken literally, similar to how post is used in English. However, in English, the prefix meta is used more abstractly. For example, in English, the term metaphysics refers to a philosophy that is above and beyond the physical world. In modern times, the prefix meta has come to mean something self-referential, often in a humorous way. For example, a meta-discussion is a discussion about discussions, and metadata is data about your data. In a similar way, metaprogramming is above and beyond conventional programming and is self-referential and that metaprogramming is about writing programs that can write other programs. In conventional programming, there's a clear distinction between code and data. In metaprogramming, the line between code and data is blurred. Metaprogramming is a programming technique that allows code to be treated as data, which allows that code to be analyzed and modified just like data in other data structures. Because code can be treated just like data, metaprogramming allows data to be used to generate new code, which allows a programmer to automate some mundane tasks, making that programmer much more productive. Not all programming languages support metaprogramming. Julia does. Last week, we saw how Julia turns code into data at parse time. By turning our code into unevaluated data, called an expression, we could then index into the expression just like any other data structure. We also learned that we could generate this ourselves by using the expr constructor. There's actually a third way of constructing an expression that I didn't show you last week. The formal way to construct an expression is by using the quote end block. However, this is a little different than the previous two examples. You can see the difference by using the dump function. You can also see the difference in the workspace panel where ex1 and ex2 are listed as unevaluated expressions, while ex3 is listed as code that is of type expression. You can evaluate your expression at any time by using the eval function. Notice in the workspace panel that ex1, ex2, and ex3 are still displayed as unevaluated expressions. The eval function does not convert the expression into a value, it only returns the evaluated value. Notice that the variable ans displays the last evaluated value. You can mutate the contents of your expression like other data structures.
Now, instead of adding 1 plus 1, the expression is multiplying 2 times 3. You can use the pushbang and popbang functions like with other data structures. This changed the expression from 2 times 3 to 2 times 3 times 4. This changed the expression back to 2 times 3. Let's set up a slightly more involved expression. This generates a slightly more complex AST, but you can still index into it like other data structures. The last argument is an expression that you can index and evaluate like any other expression. You can use the pushbang and popbang functions just like before. Notice that the integer 4 showed up at the bottom. So the expression is now 1 plus the expression 2 times 3 plus 4. You can push a value into that middle multiplication expression. Now the expression is 1 plus the expression 2 times 3 times 5 plus 4. Before leaving this section, let's take a look at one final example of turning code into data. In tutorial number two, we looked at this example for how Julia follows the order of operations. Let's take a look at what this looks like as an expression. It looks complicated, but by looking at the AST, you can follow the logic that Julia is using for the order of operations. Parentheses, exponents, multiplication, then addition. Like the previous examples, this is an unevaluated expression, which you can evaluate using the eval function. You can also modify it just like the previous examples. I'll leave that for you as an exercise that you can play with at your convenience. For now, let's move on to learn how to turn data into code. Now we know how to turn code into data. So, how do we turn data into code? This example is from the Julia documentation with some modifications. Let's say you're using a composite type called Dago with one field named X which is of type float64. Let's populate doggo with a value of pi and bind it to the variable called lowercase a. Now, let's try to use the variable a with some built-in functions. None of these functions work because there's no method for your composite type. As a workaround, you could type in something like this. That would give you the answer you want, but it would be more convenient if you just set up a new method for these functions to include your composite type. You can add a new method to each function manually, like you learned in tutorial number 7. However, it would be more convenient if you could somehow set up all of these functions in a data structure, like a tuple, and then use a for loop to iterate over the data to generate new code to create new methods for all of those functions. That would be like using data to generate new code, or writing a program to write another program. This is clearly not conventional programming, but with metaprogramming, this is possible. Here's how to do that in Julia.
Did you see anything happen? Let's try reusing those same functions. They all work now. Now let's take a look at the methods. You can see that the for loop created a new method for this function. Let's do a quick check of the methods for the other functions. They are all there now. Pretty cool, right? Let's take a closer look at the code, since there's a lot going on, even though it's only a few lines of code. In expressions, functions are listed as symbols, which is why all of those functions have a colon in front of them in the tuple. The quote end block is used to set up an unevaluated expression. The dollar sign is used to interpolate the function name into the expression. The eval function evaluates the expression which generates a new method for that function, essentially converting data into new code. And then the for loop iterates over the entire collection and does the same thing for every function. For example, the first iteration is the same as manually typing in a new method for sign. Maybe this example wasn't a huge time saver, but you can imagine how useful this would be if you had hundreds of functions to update every time you created a new composite type. Knowing that you can now write programs to write new programs will change the way you think about programs. Now that's meta. Another aspect of metaprogramming is something called macros. Macros are like the dark arts of the programming world. While it's important to know what they are, it's also equally important to be wary of them. That's why I've saved the subject for last. We've already seen some built-in macros like at which, which shows the method being used for an operator or a function. Last week, we saw a few more built-in macros like at code typed and at code native. On the surface, macros are like functions, but are invoked using the at character and without parentheses. Unlike functions, macros execute when code is parsed, which gives you the opportunity to generate and include fragments of customized code before the full program is run. Let's take a look at how to create a custom macro. You can create a macro just like a function, except instead of using the function end block, you can use the macro end block. Just like you've done with the built-in macros, you invoke your new macro by using the at sign immediately before your macro name and without parentheses. You can examine the expression generated during the macro expand step by using the at macro expand macro. Note that you're using a macro to examine another macro. I mean, how meta is that? At this point, you might be wondering, why would I ever need a macro? Couldn't I just do this with a function? The answer is yes, you can do this with a function. In most cases, anything that you can do with a macro, you can also do with a function. Therefore, the rule of thumb is to always use a function and only consider using a macro as a last resort. Here's an example of a macro that can't be replaced with a function. This example is taken from a blog post written by Bogomil Kaminsky. I apologize for my pronunciation. He is the primary maintainer of the dataframes.jl package and a wealth of knowledge concerning Julia. A link to his original blog post is provided in the description below. Let's say you want to set up an array of empty arrays so that you can fill it later with some data. You can do that very easily with a comprehension. Now, let's say you want to populate each of the empty arrays with the integer one. Let's try using the push bank function. Well, that sort of worked. It only populated the empty array at index one, 
So you'll have to repeat this process eight more times, or write a for loop. Now, let's try using a macro to see what happens. Start by creating a new macro called empty array. This macro doesn't do much. All it does is set up an empty array. Let's try using this macro in the same comprehension as before. So far, array B looks the same as the initial state of array A. Now, let's try to push the integer 1 into index 1. What happened? The integer 1 has now populated all of the empty arrays, so there's no need to create a for loop to repeat the step. That's weird. Is array A and array B the same? So array A and array B have equal values, but there's something different about them. Let's try to mutate array A and array B to see what happens. This added the integer 2 into the array at index 1, which is expected. Now, let's try to do the same thing with array B. That's so strange. So what's going on here? In the comprehension that set up array A, a new empty array with its own memory location was created for every index of array A. In the comprehension that set up array B, we use the macro at empty array. What the macro did was set up one empty array with one memory location, and then it stopped. The comprehension went on to complete its task of setting up the array of empty arrays, but rather than creating a new empty array for each index, all it did was point every index to the same memory location. Pretty spooky, right? Like I said, dark arts. Do not try doing this at 3 a.m. Macros can be a powerful tool, but you have to know what you're doing. Beginners are discouraged from creating their own macros and instead encouraged to find solutions using functions. However, beginners are encouraged to use the built-in macros since they were, presumably, created by people who know what they're doing. With that said, here are some useful built-in macros. Using this macro opens up the file that contains the source code for the operation or function. If you use this enough times, you'll discover that a lot of the Julia source code is written in Julia itself. Imagine creating a new programming language so you can create a new programming language. Now that's the ultimate meta. Using this macro is an alternative to the print line function and allows you to insert custom text preceded by the info heading in a different color, which can be useful for debugging purposes. Using this macro is another alternative to the print line function and allows for succinct feedback while your program is running. Again, this can be useful for debugging purposes. At info and at show are examples of macros that can be replaced by a function, namely the print line function. This next example cannot be replaced by a function. Using this macro measures the time in seconds for whatever follows the macro. As with any macro, proceed with caution. Well, that's it for today. Today, we continue to explore Julia under the hood by learning about metaprogramming and macros. Believe it or not, this concludes all of the new material for this tutorial series. If you made it this far, congratulations. <laughs> Next week will be the final tutorial in this series. Rather than introducing any more new concepts, we'll wrap up the series by working on some fun projects to apply what we've learned. So stay tuned for that. If you enjoyed this video and you feel like you learned something new, 
please give it a thumbs up. For more Wholesome Julia tutorials, please be sure to subscribe and hit that bell. New tutorials are posted on Sundays. If you have any questions, please post them in the comments below. Feel free to spread the word by sharing this video, since I'm sure you'll all agree that this is the finest tutorial on all of YouTube. Worst tutorial ever.